السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ویلکم ٹو آور سیریز ایسنس آف اسلام ان دا سوسائٹی وی لیو ٹوڈے ریلیجن از بینگ اٹیکڈ فرام آل سائڈس اینڈ اسلام ان پرٹیکولر دیر آر مینی ایلیگیشنز ریز اگینسٹ دا ویریس ٹیچنگز آف اسلام پیپل ڈو ناٹ انڈرسٹینڈ دا ٹرو ٹیچنگز آف اسلام دا ریلیجن آف اسلام ایز ایکسپلین بائی دا ہولی پرافت صلی اللہ وسلم ہیز بین فرگاٹن بائی دا مسلمس دم سالوس The latter day Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani Islam, brought the true teachings of Islam to the forefront once again. In this series of compilation, it is called The Essence of Islam. There are five volumes, and the extracts from the writings of the Promised Messiah Islam, have been gathered under various topics. Uh, we have been discussing different topics, and today we will be discussing the to- topic of marriage and righteous progeny. In the studio with me, we have two of my colleagues, Rizwan Shah Rukh Abbas Sahib and Rizwan Muhammad Sahib. Rizwan Sahib, let's start with you that, you know, today when we look at our society, generally speaking, people are moving away from the institution of marriage. And those who do tend to get married, it is at a much older age compared to even if we go, let's say, 50 years back. And if they do get married, then there's the issue of divorce. The divorce rate is very high. And people generally say that, you know, whatever the institution of marriage has to offer, you know, we're enjoying our lives. So why tie ourselves down? So to these people, you know, how do we answer them? What do we say to them that why do we need to get married? So that's a really good question. The Promised Messiah, Islam, he has mentioned in his book, Cheshmai Marfat, which is also uh, from The Essence of Islam, Volume 3. And he has mentioned the different purposes of marriage. The first uh, purpose which he has mentioned is that so through the system of marriage, there be a progeny, there be an offspring that would remember God. So when we look at this, we see that this is in line with the teachings of the Holy Quran as well, where we find that Allah Ta'ala says that, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةَ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created the jinn and the men except so that they may worship me. So we see that our very purpose of creation is for the remembrance and worship of Allah Ta'ala. Secondly, the Prophet Messiah Islam, he has mentioned uh, that physically as well, there is a protection between the husband and the wife. The husband is a shield for the wife and the wife is a shield for the husband. So that protection is from illicit desires, from uh, you know, illicit relationships, from uh, lustful inclinations. So this physical uh, protection is also there and both act as a shield for one, uh, uh, for one another. Thirdly, we find that not only physically but mentally and uh, psychologically as well, uh, both the husband and, and wife, they are a source or a means of support for one another. So through trials and tribulations, uh, to protect each other from depression, loneliness. So all these things, they are part of that system of marriage which is uh, mentioned in Islam. And I think it's, it's very important, especially the point you mentioned in the beginning, that you know you get uh, progeny which is righteous progeny. And the big benefit, uh, in my opinion, from this is, and the Promised Messiah, Islam, he's also highlighted this fact, that when you're having children through the institution of marriage, those children are able to have a, you know, a guardianship over them which look after their different needs. Because what happens is that especially the society we're living in today where people are having a relationship outside of the institution of marriage, there are a lot of children which are being brought up by single parents. And as a result of that, it's a vicious cycle that when they grow up, uh, they don't have, uh, they're unable to learn from both the father and the parent and the mother because only one uh, parent is there in that household. And then that cycle continues. So, you know, Islam mentioning this and the Promised Messiah, Islam, highlighting this fact that through the institution of marriage, the couple, you know, they're having their own security. And at the same time, we're also securing our future generations. There is a proper system of their upbringing. But Shahrukh Sahib, having said that, if we are to get married, you know, it's not a commitment that is for one day or 
uh, for a week or a month or even a year. You know, people, for example, even if they want to buy a car or even let's say something as small as picking up a cell phone, you know, people compare the odds, people compare the pros and cons. And uh, then after that, they understand that this is going to be a commitment. So, you know, I need to think through. So when it comes to marriage, how should we select our spouse? I mean, it's not something that we can take lightly. So somebody who has this question that, okay, we, he says, um, I accept the institution of marriage, but how do I choose my spouse? So how would we respond to them? So um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of cultures, they enforce uh, arranged marriages on couples and couples are, you know, um, you know, they're wed without their consent. But Islam is a, a religion that has allowed uh, a girl and a boy, um, you know, to choose their, their spouse. And their I partner. Think, you know, I want this point to be understood because many people, they have the same allegation and they raise it against Islam, mm -hmm. that Islam mm -hmm. is also one of those religions mm -hmm. that forces, you know, arranged marriage, so to, so, so to well, speak. When we see the life of the Holy Prophet, وسلم, we see that, you know, there were instances where, you know, there were, um, you know, girls or guys that, that would, you know, speak their mind and say, you know, we want to marry such and such a person and the Holy Prophet would, would, would allow it. And um, so, you know, this is something which Islam does allow, you know, for the girl and the guy, you know, to, to pick their spouse. Um, obviously, the main thing is that, you know, when, we, when we're looking for a spouse, we should pray. And when we, when we, are, when we see a, a prospect or, you know, the first thing we should see is if that person is righteous or not. And this is exactly what the Holy Prophet wasallam said as well, that the first thing which is everlasting and which goes on for a very, very long time is uh, spirituality, piety, and character. Everything else fades away. And the Promised Messiah, Lisatu Islam, also said the same thing, that the basis of uh, finding a prospect should be spirituality and piety and character. And everything else is extra. And, um, you know, because just because of this very uh, reason that, you know, beauty fades away, right? But these things don't. So, um, and then it's one time, uh, someone had asked the, uh, the question about compatibility because compatibility is, is also very important. And the Promised Messiah, Lisa, uh, Islam, has said that, you know, compatibility is important, but it's not mandatory. So if you do find someone compatible, uh, that's very good, and you should, do, and you should uh, uh, pursue that prospect. But in case if you don't find anyone, then it's not man mandatory as such. So, um, you know, um, to find a spouse, the main thing has to be piety. You know, because that is something that goes a long way. Yeah, and I think uh, that is the main issue that our society today is facing. That, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning, that people are moving away from religion. Religion mm -hmm. is not a priority. So uh, the byproduct of that is that righteousness is not a priority, right? And the main thing nowadays is, especially the society we're living is, is you know, is uh, the physical attractiveness. And what happens is that you have a lot of these uh, apps, you have a lot of these other uh, websites where dating, you know, you, it starts with looking at the picture, right? So the, according to the Islamic teachings, right away you're starting with the wrong concept because you're looking at that attractiveness. And as you mentioned that, you know, that is uh, sooner or later is going to fade away. And then once you get into that cycle, then it's always there that, you know, okay, can I find something better? Or if you look at somebody more attractive, then obviously you would have those thoughts and you, know, might, you might, might want to finish this relationship uh, and move on. But now, so we understand the Holy Prophet وسلم, he gave us a criteria that the main thing should be uh, righteousness, it should be the piety of the person. Uh, having selected a spouse, we get into a relationship. Uh, is once I have, what would our responsibilities towards each other be? How should our treatment according to the uh, teachings of Islam towards each other be? Because this is again something that many people say that Islam gives uh, too much power to the man uh, and the woman has no say whatsoever in the household. So how would we address this issue? So we can see that Islam, uh, you know, it gives about different roles in the marriage. So we find that uh, within Islam, the man, he is the benefactor. He is the one who is responsible for taking care of the wife and the children. So even if the wife goes out and she works, um, she has a job, she has an income, she does not have to come home and spend that money on the, uh, on the husband or the children. That money is hers. She can choose where she wants to spend that money. So, but on the other hand, when we look at uh, the husband, we can see that he is responsible for uh, spending that money on his family, on his wife, on his children. 
So we can see that he has that responsible uh, role of taking care of the wife and taking care of the family. But the wife, she is free to um, you know, spend her money as she likes. And even uh, we can see that whatever money that the husband gives in the marriage, whatever jewelry that he gives, anything that he gives to the wife, even at the time of the, the divorce, he, does not, he cannot take that money back. He cannot give that jewelry back. When we look at uh, how the spouse should be, uh, the treatment of the spouse, we find uh, the examples of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the example of the Promised Messiah Islam, as well. And the Promised Messiah Islam, he has mentioned in the Chashmai Marfat uh, that all weaknesses and behavior of the woman should be tolerated by the husband. And that's except for indecency. And he says that it's very shameful that a man should fight with the woman. So we can see the example of uh, uh, the Promised Messiah Islam. He has also mentioned that in uh, this book that once he, he raised his voice against his uh, wife. So immediately he, you know, he thought that uh, I have done something wrong, something that I shouldn't have done. So he said he apologized, he, um, um, he sought forgiveness, he did istighfar, he gave some charity and he offered some nawafil. So we can see uh, the status of women and the respect that uh, the respect of women that has been given in Islam and we can see even the example of the Promised Messiah Islam that even just simply raising his voice against uh, his wife was something which uh, is not, was not tolerated by him as well. Um, and you know we also have the hadith of the Holy Prophet وسلم, where he said that you know khairukum, khairukum li ahlihi, that the best of, uh, amongst you is one who is you know best uh, in regards to the treatment of his family and especially his spouse. And as you give that example, we find many such examples uh, in the life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the Promised Messiah and the Khulafa that how they always take, uh, took good care of their spouse uh, and their children. And you know, from this example you mentioned of the Promised Messiah, that just by raising his voice, he became so concerned. And you know, it's mentioned that he did a lot of astaghfar and he gave sadaqah, charity. So those people who are taking the teachings of Islam and twisting them and trying to use them in a way that whereby Islam is giving them certain um, extra power or something, they need to understand, they need to learn from the example of the Holy Prophet ﷺ and the Promised Messiah that those were the men who best understood the teachings of Islam. And through their practice, we can best understand the teachings of Islam. And they never ever raised a hand against their spouse. And even in this example, that just raising his wife, his voice, and you know, we do that all the time. Sometimes we get angry and you know, uh, there's shouting happening. But just that, I mean, imagine that. And unfortunately, there's people today, and Muslims today as well, uh, who are not understanding the true teachings of Islam, who are not understanding the essence uh, behind those teachings. And as a result of that, they're having those personal issues. And those issues which they're having, uh, you know, get blamed on the teachings of Islam, whereas the truth is totally the opposite. So we have been uh, discussing today the concept of uh, marriage and uh, righteous progeny. Uh, we discussed why we need to get married, how we should be selecting our spouse. Uh, we'll be back after a short break. When a hot-tempered person is provoked and punishes a child, he takes on the role of an enemy in the stress of his anger and imposes punishment far in excess of the wrong which has been done. An individual with self-respect and control over himself who is also forbearing and dignified, has the right to correct a child to a certain extent as the occasion demands or seek to guide the child. But a wrathful and hot-headed person who is easily provoked is not fit to be a guardian of children. I wish that instead of punishing children, parents would have recourse to prayer and should make it a habit to supplicate earnestly for their children for the supplications of parents on behalf of their children meet with special acceptance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back. Uh, we were discussing uh, marriage and righteous progeny and uh, we were discussing uh, the treatment of the spouses towards each other. And you know, sometimes people don't fully understand that uh, being nice to each other is different and having a difference of opinion is totally different. So we find this that even at the, in the life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, he would have difference of opinion with his uh, spouses. Same thing with the Promised Messiah uh, He would have a difference of opinion with his uh, wife. So having a difference of opinion is okay. 
But the main thing to understand is, as Rizwan Sahib, you were mentioning, is that uh, we need to treat them well, our spouses, and we need to have that, uh, you know, friendly relationship. Uh, I remember the, there's one, these mentioned, uh, uh, one incident of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, that once he was sitting with one spouse in the house of one spouse, and another wife, she sent some sweet. And this, uh, the uh, house where he was at, that wife became angry that if the Holy Prophet ﷺ is here, why is this wife sending sweet food to, you know, can I not cook for the Holy Prophet ﷺ? So she took, uh, you know, the burton, uh, the plate which the sweet was served in, and she threw it down and she broke it. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he obviously understood, uh, you know, sometimes we have that jealousy, sometimes we're human nature's end of the day. So he said that, you know, okay, just make sure you send a different plate back to the other wife, right? So, I mean, that is fine, you know, having that relationship uh, with our spouse where we have uh, small fights. But end of the day, the religion of Islam tells us that, uh, you know, our spouse is our best friend, is somebody who can, we can share our secrets with. Uh, and through that relationship, we can have a higher, uh, we can achieve higher morality. Uh, Shahrukh Sahib, uh, you know, when that marriage is to take place, you know, we've gone through the process of selecting our spouse. Uh, and now, um, you know, the entire procedure of getting married, there are many rituals, ceremonies attached. And sometimes a lot of these rituals and ceremonies, they're cultural, they're not Islamic. So how do we differentiate between the two? What does Islam say uh, about marriage, about the ceremonies or rituals that are permitted and that we can uh, have during our marriage uh, process? So when you look at um, what Islam permits, uh, we see that, you know, to sum it up, it would be nikah, ruksati, and uh, wulima. So ruksati does not have to be a, a proper function. It can be where the girl, you know, she, um, she goes with her husband, you know, to his house. Um, and so this is exactly, this is what Islam has prescribed. But unfortunately, as time went on, um, you know, cultures started to, to take over and, you know, uh, Muslims started to have big gatherings and they spent a lot of money and, and it became a competition. And, uh, you know, so a lot of innovations, uh, you know, were, were introduced, uh, you know, wrong innovations were introduced within uh, the, the, this uh, ceremony of marriage as such. And, um, you know, where a lot of money was spent, um, and, and, you know, that becomes ex um, extravagant. And the Holy Quran, you know, clearly says that those who are extravagant are, brother, are brothers of Satan. So, um, you know, the Promised Messiah Islam, has said that every Ahmadi should eradicate such evil uh, customs. And, you know, he said that, you know, and, and, and I'll narrate a small story. Uh, um, Nawab Ali Khan Sab, you know, he was the son-in-law of the Promised Messiah Islam, And he talks about how uh, simple his marriage was and the ruksati was of, uh, with uh, Nawab Mubarakah Begum Sahib. And he says that, you know, after the nikah, um, I went to read namaz and I came back. And uh, Amma John, you know, she, she, she pointed towards uh, my wife and said that, you know, I'm leaving this orphan child with you. And she said, Asalaamu Alaikum and left. And the woman, you know, she went with me. So he, he explained how simple it was. Right, and and the Promised Messiah uh, has also said that you know in Malfuzat that uh, yes, wulima is important, but you know to to spend money and to go out of your way and and uh, you know do all these things that's un that's un-Islamic. That's just a lot of money going to waste. Yeah, and I mean even Hazur he has been drawing our attention towards this that uh, members of the Jamaat in particular, that when we're having these ceremonies, we need to be careful uh, about the money we're spending. And Hazur has been mentioning that, uh, for example, something as small as printing cards, people spend a lot of money and so much that other families who are not that well off, uh, they can have the entire uh, ceremony with that amount. So end of the day, we have to see, uh, you know, what the true teachings of Islam are and what they're telling us, what that requirement is, as long as we're fulfilling that requirement. And uh, from there, if we have the resources, yes, it can be uh, you know, a modest uh, ceremony, but we should always remember that end of the day, you know, we're following the teachings of the Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and in this day and age, uh, we have accepted the Latter-day Messiah. And as such, uh, we have a higher responsibility of following uh, the true teachings of Islam. When we see, um, uh when we study Islam, we see that more emphasis is laid on the married life instead of the actual wedding. 
uh, but culture, you know, um, sheds more light or, or um, you know, emphasis or, or lays emphasis on, on having a, a grand wedding, but not so much in, in the actual marriage life. You know, so these are two different things, um, but in Islam, you know, more emphasis is laid on, you know, to be good to each other, you know, to, um, you know, to not demand things as, uh, um, as such. And going back to the point that uh, Rizwan Sal was talking about, treatment of, of spouses, we see that one time, uh, has a, uh, you know, that a, a servant and who used to live in the house of the Promised Messiah, Lissat Islam, she said that, you know, Mirza Sal, he listens to his wife, like, 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 like all the time. Yeah. You know, like whatever she says, go like you know goes. And um, I'll yeah, talk. And I, and I remember. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know the name of the companion, uh, but I remember there's an incident that they were saying that Bahar bhi queen ka raja, Malka ka raja, aur andar bhi Malka ka raja. You know, because uh, uh, India was under the British. Uh, yeah. uh, it was a British colony yeah. at that time. Yeah. So exactly as you're saying. So they were. You know, he was very kind, and you know, even our current Hazur. You know, I, you know, and when Hazur had come to Calgary, I'd seen that. You know, he would walk behind his wife. And he made sure that you know she was okay, and you know, um, and uh, you know she, he took her upstairs to the elevator and stuff. So that was something which was a lesson for us, you know, that this is how you're supposed to treat your spouse with respect. Yeah, right? yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. I think even in one of the missionaries' uh, meetings in one of the countries, uh, Hazur mentioned that you know the missionaries they're supposed to serve even each weekend. And he said that, you know, each month you have one weekend off. And he said that even that is for your wife and your mm -hmm. children, that you're mm -hmm. supposed to take them somewhere. So this is what we learn, you know, from these people who understand the teaching of Islam best, uh, that this is what they exhibited. This is through their personal example. They're uh, leading us. It's not that they're telling us to do something which we are not doing. Or rather, they are uh, teaching us through their own example. But it is once, up, uh, you know, we have spoken about treatment of the spouses, but if you can briefly tell us uh, that the children, what kind of treatment should we have for the children for their upbringing so that they can have uh, a good life? I think, uh, you know, the children, they should be uh, treated with kindness, compassion. Usually we have this thing, um, you know, the way we grow up, we always put that fear of God in them. Uh, in the sense that we say that if you do this, Allah will get mad. But uh, I have a feeling that instead of that, we can also say if, we, if you do this, Allah will be happy. Yeah. So we should have that, uh, you know, that we should instill that, uh, the love of Allah Ta'ala in our children. And we, and we should treat them in a sense that uh, we are friends with them. They can come to us, they can tell us about any, uh, anything that they have, any problems that they have, any difficult, uh, difficulties that they face. So the parents should be uh, someone who is a friend to the child and the child can uh, come up to them anytime and talk to them about any other, uh, any problems that they have. But we find that today, uh, many times, uh, instead of going to the parent, they would rather go to a friend, they would, uh, they would rather uh, go to some, some other person An besides the parent, outside. So this causes problems because it, it causes a lot of, uh, you know, a break within the family and uh, that's harmful for uh, the family as well. Yeah, and I, I think th uh, this is exactly as what you mentioned. Hazru has been highlighting as, this as well, that the parents, especially the fathers, they need to have a friendly relationship uh, with their children. Uh, and we find this, you know, in the life of the Promised Messiah, Islam, as well, that he had a very friendly relationship with his children and he was always there worried about their uh, upbringing. Uh, and the thing he said was that it's very interesting that he said that the most important thing regarding the upbringing of the children is prayer the weapon of prayer. Uh, and we discussed this in one of our other episodes as well. Uh, and he said that those parents uh, who sometimes try to either, you know, by force uh, get their children to do something, he said that it's, it's a form of shirk associating, you know, partners with God. Because you would think that by physically uh, abusing them or, you know, hitting them, you can uh, mold them into a certain thing. So he said that the real thing should be that you're telling your children uh, every now and then, then this should be like this or this should be like that. Uh, but the most important weapon is prayer. And also in one incident, Hazur mentioned uh, uh, regarding Hazrat Mr. Sani that when he was a child in school, they were discussing whether uh, knowledge is better or wealth. And, uh, you know, we hear that and we read that incident that uh, that particular night when they were sitting down having food, uh, as a Muslim, he told one of the brothers because he was shy uh, that, you know, ask the Promised Messiah, Abba, you know, is uh, ilm zyada uh, chai ya dolat? And the Promised Messiah, right away, he said that, you know, toba karo, toba karo. 
نہ علم اچھا ہے نہ دولت یو نو اللہ تعالیٰ کا فضل اچھا ہے دیٹ از دا بلیسنگ دا گریس آف اللہ تعالیٰ سو دس از سم تھنگ دا پیرنٹس ہیو ٹو انسٹل ان دیر چلڈرین اینڈ اٹ از فرام دیر اون ایگزامپل یو نو اف وی ناٹ پرزینٹنگ اے گڈ ایگزامپل دین اٹ از ڈفیکلٹ دیٹ وی ایکسپیکٹ آور چلڈرین ٹو ڈو سم تھنگ آلس جزاک اللہ فار جوائننگ می فار دس ڈسکشن ٹوڈے وی ہیو بین ڈسکسنگ ڈفرینٹ ٹاپکس فرام دی ایسنس آف اسلام Uh, it is a five volume series uh, which uh, has extracts of the promised messiah alayhi salatu wasalam under different headings uh, you know prayer the high status of uh, the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, marriage and progeny which we discussed today uh, and many other topics so uh, we encourage our uh, viewers especially the younger viewers that whatever topic you're interested in uh, pick up a volume find that topic uh, and read a few pages and it will enlighten you it will show you the true teachings of islam sometimes we're afraid uh, of having a discussion with people because we don't understand the true teachings of islam so this is our weapon if we are able to read uh, this book if we are able to understand the concept of uh, islam then we can convey that concept to others and similarly we'll be able to defend the teachings of islam that why i am following this religion uh, and this beautiful religion So with that, uh, we finish our program today. We hope uh, you enjoyed this episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Aau logo ke yeh noor e khuda paoge lo tumhe taar tasal بتایا yeah.